Hello and welcome to the special discussion on Asia's energy options coming to you from the World Economic Forum or the Summer Davos here in Dalian, China. This talk is brought to you by Adidang TV, broadcast globally via satellite and also available on the web at adidang.com. Today's talk will focus first on how things currently stand in Asia in terms of energy, and the second half will focus on what lies ahead for us as a region in the future. So we have a distinguished panel featuring key energy players from the region, and allow me now to introduce them to you. Starting with my immediate left, we have His Excellency, the Prime Minister of Mongolia, Saikan Bileg Chimed. And to his left, Chairman Prakash Hinduja of the Hinduja Group, a multinational corporation with interests in banking and oil, among others. To his left, we have Mr. Kim Dongguan, Managing Director of the Hanwha Group, a top 10 Korean conglomerate with a leading presence in solar panels. And last but certainly not least, Dean Bo Chang Lin of the Institute for Studies in Energy Policy, Xiamen University of the People's Republic of China. So welcome to the talk gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. Let's jump straight into the discussion. We just heard in the opening plenary session from Premier Li Keqing um, reassuring everyone that China's economy, while it has slowed, is still very strong, not a source of risk, but a source of strength. But there are some new figures and a new pace of growth that we have to get used to. So let me start by asking Dean Lin, what does this mean in terms of energy? Uh, I think from economic perspective, 7% is still quite good, actually. Even if next half going down a bit, you know, even 6.5, it's still very good economic growth. But any sector does have uh, some problems. It's going down so fast and so quickly as compared to GDP. Our relationship between GDP and primary energy normally at the peak is uh, somewhere between 1 to 0.6. But last but first month of this year, GDP grows as for six months of this year, GDP is seven percent, but primary energy is less than one percent. Electricity, we have run continuously roughly at about one to one relationship between GDP and electricity consumption growth. But this year again, GDP seven percent, electricity roughly a little bit more than one percent this first half, a little bit more than one percent. So the, the, it, it, it comes out so quickly that the energy company do not know how to respond to that. And uh, if you look at all indicators that the energy company are really in, in trouble at this moment. Dean Lin, let me just uh, interrupt you there, but why the discrepancy now? Why has it changed from one to one to this great discrepancy now? I think the main problem is it comes from industrial sector, particularly heavy industry. Uh, Chinese heavy industry consume most of the energy but that includes the cement, et cetera. Uh, four major industry, heavy industry, consume roughly 60% of the electricity in China. And when heavy industry respond to the economy, economy slowing down, what they do is to reduce production, and they don't consume electricity. Even though they still can sell their inventory to support GDP, but the energy consumption is not there. So uh, the, the, I, I believe that the main problem is really from industrial side. So in associate with that is a price. Because uh, uh, very, very low energy demand at this moment lead to huge energy capacity, over capacity at this moment. Before, uh, in 20, 2011, our electricity and our energy demand, our coal demand, in our oak grow, all have a very good numbers. And therefore, corresponding to that, we made a very good plan, very, you know, uh, big plan for the energy moving forward. The result is that when we suddenly <coughs> meet the energy demand going down very quickly, we have a huge surplus. The electricity right now, I think that the, the coal fire side is roughly 20%. Okay. And coal we present eighty percent of electricity. So you can say that it, it actually system is uh, it okay. roughly twenty percent 
So let me just jump in right. right there and ask the Prime Minister Chimet now. So Dean Lin just mentioned how electricity demand has gone down, has slowed dramatically. Obviously, this is not good news for Mongolia as a prime exporter of coal to China. China, of course, being your biggest customer in terms of coal. Coal prices have gone down. What's the current <coughs> situation like for you? Right now, uh, good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, for World Economic Forum and Iran TV as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, this is good news for us because we import some of our energy demand from China and Russia as well. Okay. But uh, right now, we are building uh, this underway four different uh, power plant stations and also one big hydro plant, energy uh, hydro sta station. And that's why after a couple of years, maybe two or three years, Again, we are going to face the exactly same situation as China right now, over capacity. And that's why we need to export our energy. Mm -hmm. That's why right now is good news, but after two years it's going to be very bad news for us. And how are you preparing yeah. for that? Yes, and that's why uh, the topic of this session is also, um, the, uh, we're talking, going to talk about options. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why exactly we are um, trying to address this issue. First of all, uh, renewable energy. Mongolia has plenty of resources of this kind of energy. For example, we have uh, starting from 270 days to 300 days, sunny days. And also 10% of uh, this West Mongolian territory is very good, excellent condition for wind energy and uh, the installed capacity of over 1,100 uh, gigabyte uh, capacity. And mm -hmm. That's why this renewable uh, sector is going to be uh, one option. The another option is that Mongolia has uh, plenty vast of uh, billions of tons of coke and coal and also energy coal and that's why we need to uh, uh, change. We need to reshift our policy and that's why we're talking right now with Chinese government establishing big uh, coal to gasification uh, mm -hmm. project and okay. Big uh, gasification uh, pipeline is going to build from Mongolia to China, also okay. trying to import not coal, mm -hmm. not uh, energy, but uh, gas. Right. And this is, could be also another option. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Okay, many <laughs> options. So, Mr. Hinduja, let me ask you now. China slowing down 7% or around 7% GDP growth seems to be the new norm that we have to accept. Is this the time for India now? Will India sort of overtake China as forecast by many as the main driver of the population and also energy growth as well? What do you foresee for India and what's happening right now in India? Well, I see that India has a great potentiality mm -hmm. and uh, the requirement of the energy, which is uh, very big. And I've been talking to many Chinese companies that how this is an opportunity time where you should come in India, bring the technology and manufacture in, in China, where the demand of the power is so much over there that we are short of power and we need a huge uh, different, different technologies to come from all around the world. Now, there is a big rush from America, from Germany, from France, from uh, China, mm -hmm. from Korea, you know, from, from Italy, Everybody is entering into the country, but I'm, we are very much wondering that unless the manufacturing is not done in India, the solution <coughs> of this energy requirement will not fulfill. Is manufacturing the only problem? I understand about a third of the population, maybe 400 million people are still without electricity. No, 400 million are even with electricity. 700 million people. Okay in the villages, you know, they are the ones which are facing big problems. Mm -hmm. So how do you bring electricity to So them? that's the reason we are trying to now see through three different type of uh, programs we have. We have a hydro, we have, a, we have a windmills, we have a solar energy, we are going to go on a, a nuclear energy, thermal, you know. Now the coal, today our energy is all depending on coal based. Mm -hmm. The whole coal-based uh, is the main power. So we are trying to bring in to new type of energies into in, uh, to India, where all okay. the major companies, like uh, right. if you have a Siemens, mm -hmm. Siemens is there for more than 150 years. Okay. 
So in a similar manner, uh, we have a big companies uh, in the energy field who have done right. up to 45,000 me megawatt. Just, Mr. Hindu, just sorry, I just want to hold on and um, go to Mr. Kim, because obviously the Hanwha Group, uh, leading presence in solar energy, and also Korea, not a lot of natural resources, hardly any, but major importer of energy, and yet also an exporter of energy-related technologies. And of course, your company is one of them. Could you talk about where Korea stands and where you see the potential, maybe? I mean, I think uh, as it was uh, well publicized, I think Korea set a very ambitious target of uh, carbon reduction. And I think uh, Korean government just released a very ambitious target of uh, increasing the percentage of renewables to uh, double digits within a decade or so. And I think uh, especially because Korea, as you mentioned, is very resource constrained. And we have been investing a lot into R&D. And I think especially our strength in uh, semiconductors and display manufacturing has been transformed into our uh, manufacturing know-how for uh, solar panels as well. Mm -hmm. Well, so I think although the Korean market itself is still relatively small compared to China or India, I think uh, throughout Asia, I think uh, is especially in China and India, we have a lot to contribute in terms of uh, manufacturing innovation mm -hmm. and also in uh, bringing solutions. Uh, maybe not only conventional solutions, but with uh, microgrids and smart grids, I think there's a lot of opportunity to uh, bypass a lot of infrastructure requirements, the power transmission requirements that are necessary to bring uh, electricity to these remote villages in India. But I mean, as Premier Li said, I mean, the Chinese economy is still probably robust, but the global economic recovery is slower than expected. And in such difficult times, isn't it true that most countries will go for the cheaper fuels? Will they not revert back to maybe coal, more oil? I mean, how is this going to affect our carbon footprint and the economy, the market? What? Not necessarily. Uh, if you look at the uh, number for the first six months of the China's energy number, the coal uh, dropped by 8.3%. So that's good news for everyone that the China will be first time in roughly 20 to 30 years, the CO2 emission will be negative, not, not positive. Of course, that I'm not saying that this is going to be P for CO2. I, we still commit to P CO2 at 2030. But I say that uh, it's quite not necessary, that, that judgment is not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. And most of you look at the renewable energy, for six months increased by 16%. So therefore, it really depends on how government guide the sec private or public and private sectors to war uh, cleaner and also a lower carbon development path. Right. So obviously, government policy is always very important in guiding the market and also the country towards cleaner sources. Um, tell us, with Mongolia, with coal being such a huge <coughs> Portion. I mean, you mentioned other options, but coal obviously right now is probably the most viable option. How do you foresee the future of coal and what are you doing to sort of mitigate the risk? Or That's why in one side, mm -hmm. of course, there is the demand and also uh, some pollution issues, ecological issues, and uh, uh, important to going in this direction. But in other side also, we need to address the everyday problem, and every government has this kind of burdensome. Right now, I'm just going to bring you one example. We just uh, finalized a couple of years ago our uh, wind uh, plant, and still the cost uh, for households on wind energy, it's renewable energy, still higher than this traditional method. And that's why every year government have to uh, put certain amount in our budget to give subsidies uh, toward those uh, uh, plants. And that's why, of course, technology is getting better. Uh, some people is also arguing this revolutionizing and getting better. But still, there is the plenty of uh, job we have to done uh, because they need to competitive price they need to have. Mm -hmm. And in this regard, again, of course, this is the goal. This is the principle we need to follow. But right now, also, we need some kind of transitional policy in this regard. Right. And that's why I'm still thinking in next 20, maybe 30 years, the coal uh, consumption, uh, coal reliance still will be there. And mm -hmm. that's why, again, uh, I just uh, previously mentioned this, that changing this coal into gasification, changing this coal into liquid uh, 
benzene, diesel, uh, other oil uh, products. That's the also keeping good balance between uh, during these uh, two or three decades. Okay, so. In Korea's case, um, we've had a government-led policy of green growth, of switching to more eco-footprint-friendly energy sources. How important were those policies and government support? Were they essential in, in, in implementing and also growing that business as well for I mean, you? I think uh, the, it was important in kick-starting the cycle of mm -hmm. innovation. But I think uh, once that started, I think uh, innovation and cost reduction in and, in and itself has uh, driven a lot of this uh, cost reduction. And I think, uh, so I, I see in places like India or even the United States where we see uh, parity of solar energy with uh, coal or other sources. And uh, I think uh, recently we just signed a PPA in the United States for at about four cents per kilowatt hour for uh, solar energy. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, four cents is about as close to uh, coal as we've seen with uh, renewable sources. So I think, uh, once that government policy kind of uh, stimulated Important that kind of innovation, but mm -hmm. I think since then the market dynamics right. have driven down the, uh, cr the price curve. Okay. So government policies and subsidies obviously very important to kickstart the industry. Um, implementation is probably a different story and depending on which country. China obviously implemented quite well. India, do you see a problem in implementing government-led policy regarding energy? Is that a problem? implementing policy, Mr. Well, Hinduja? Well, you see, uh, in India, there has been a new reforms which has brought out by the new government, by Prime Minister Modi and his energy minister, who is a very dynamic minister, Mr. Piyush. And he is trying to come up with the new reforms in coal and the new re reforms in organizing the whole structuring of the energy program in India. Okay. which is a big plan and they are taking advice from different different uh, areas from the world and they have been working on it very progressively and there is a big uh, plan going to be in 2020 they are planning to see that how they could advance uh, the renewable energies in a big way their target is to go in a renewable energy in a big way mm -hmm. and that is why uh, our group, Hinduja group, which is having a power project now in, in Hyderabad, in Vaisagapatnam, which is a thermal coal-based plan, which we are going to you know, inaugurate uh, by next month, okay. which will be a very big power project, coal-based plan. But our plan is to go to renewable energy in a big right. way, because the new generation Mm -hmm. My yes. nephew, you yes. know, who has just come back from Columbia University, <laughs> he's going to come up with the renewable energy scheme yes. plans. Mr. Hinduja, um, I just want to go to back to Mr. Lin for just your comments on what we've been discussing right now before we break and go to the future of our energy situation here in Asia. Mr. Lin, what, what have you been thinking about to this? Discussion. So this intensive implementation, is that correct? Sorry? Is that about implementation of the energy policy? Yes, okay. yes. I think that the government is doing quite a good job in China. Uh, if you that just connect to your earlier comment, that people normally choose a cheaper price, better right. quality. Mm -hmm. If you look at renewables, you're more expensive and your quality is not good. But if China can still manage uh, substantial growth in wind and solar, that means the Chinese policy on the wind development is quite effective. Mm -hmm. How do you see it implementation in India? Mr. Hinduja didn't really answer my question. <laughs> well, that in, Mr. Hinduja, I have to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. but no, but you, see, you, see, you see, the point is that today in India, I mean to say, as I said, things are changing a lot. Yes. Things are moving. Yes. Because the Prime Minister, when he recently visited Mongolia, mm -hmm. now never Prime Minister of India has ever been to Mongolia. And the prime minister is a witness. I mean to say, he, their agreements had been signed. Right. And now they are also planning to go, in, you know, to Africa, for example. Okay. You see, Africa also, they have a lot of coal. Of course. But they don't have the skill. Mm -hmm. So the India is trying to see how they can go in, uh, in African countries. So also you're saying there. until now, maybe implementation has been slow, but things are changing, especially with Mr. Modi in power now, <laughs> and things are showing change. Right. Yes? Okay. We had very fruitful discussions with uh -huh. Mr. Modi during his uh, state visit to Mongolia and also uh, we uh, agreed to establish an investment fund together and also solidly based on the infrastructure sector, mm -hmm. especially in the energy sector, because 
this is the also need for two countries also engage with the, on win-win principles. Oh, super. Well, we're going to talk more about the future of regional infrastructure cooperation in the region. But first, let's take a short look at this video. Global leaders will meet in Paris at the end of the year to make a promise to cut carbon dioxide emissions. The aim is to limit global warming to below 2 degrees Celsius. China, Japan and Korea have already filed their plans that show marked cuts in emissions with peaks by or before 2035. But will those goals be enough? Major changes toward more environment-friendly renewable energy sources will have to be made. Developed and developing countries are investing and greater cooperation and collaboration are called for. But with fossil fuels like oil and coal so cheap and change so expensive, old habits die hard. So Asia, of course, is forecast to be the main driver of demand for energy. Of course, that means more focus will be put on Asia to deliver that growth in a sustainable and a cleaner manner. Is it realistically possible, though, considering that we have this mix of developing and developed countries, of countries still striving to get electricity to its people? How realistic is that? Mr. Lin, maybe you can start us off. I think that it's quite difficult uh, for different countries uh, in terms of different development stages, they have their view of the cost, energy costs are quite different. But let's give, you, give everyone a better news. The China, if Chinese emission of CO2 because of coal slowing down very quickly, is really reduced substantially. The, what we're looking at is it become quite, uh, quite promising. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm saying that is that in the past, when Chinese coal growth at about roughly about 8%, something like that, many people are very frustrated. Because no matter how well, what we what we do here, it's not going to compensate whatever the Chinese coal emission there. So with the Chinese coal coming down and coming down substantially, mm -hmm. whatever we are discussing in terms of global targets, everything, I think it be, it, it's going to become uh, much more promising. promising. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kim, how do you think Korea managed to balance economic growth and also sort of switch to cleaner energy sources. We managed to do this in a relatively short period of time. What do you think was the key? I mean, I think uh, the Korean case is interesting in that I think we still have a very uh, robust manufacturing sector, yet we still managed to uh, make that switch. And I think uh, it was a confluence of factors, including I think the previous administration was very focused on green growth, and, but we also uh, employed a lot of nuclear energy as well. And I think this is uh, a path that I think some economies might be able to imitate, but others, because we're relatively smaller compared to China or India, I think we were able to do that, make that transition much easier than uh, others. Do you think that countries like Korea and India have maybe a responsibility to help out other countries in terms of, of acquiring the technology maybe needed to switch to a cleaner source of energy? Yeah, sure. I, think, I think that's... That's what we see already happening. I think uh, because we've been able to, I think uh, the, the, the energy market in, in the Asian region has become more and more integrated. And I think especially because I think it's going to be impossible to just ask people to ch choose a more expensive source and hope for a large adoption, I think. So what's happening now, I think, with, with renewables is that we're trying to make renewables actually more economic than coal or or oil, and I think that's probably the only way we could actually uh, solve, fundamentally solve these issues. And I think in terms of both wind and solar, and especially solar because I know the sector better, I think we're almost there, or we're there in parts of the world, especially mm -hmm. in India or China where the construction cost is much lower and where land is right. more available. I think we've seen parity with uh, coal-fired coal okay. plants. 
Um, Prime Minister, you mentioned that Mongolia, one of the major options is renewables, wind and solar. You have the right conditions for that. So what is what do you foresee as the major challenges maybe and also the opportunities in getting that sort of renewable energy up and running? Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of commitment, uh, everything is fine because uh, we have to comply with international standards and mm -hmm. these policies and that's why we recently adopted our new uh, energy law amendments to energy law and also a new renewable energy law mm -hmm. and also a state policy on energy. And in terms of legal environment, it's getting better and uh, moving uh, to this direction. Again, the most difficult thing and burdensome for any government, especially for the government of Mongolia, is that how can we uh, fast shift and also how can we do with the traditional uh, resources of mm -hmm. energy and how should we uh, bring uh, the new technology because right. if comparing just five six years ago mm -hmm. the traditional power plant station technology and right, right now the proposal it's totally different to be a different picture and that's so why we also have to think about that after two decades from well, maybe 2030 by this time also the traditional method of uh, energy resource also in terms of emission, in terms of pollution right. will be also in terms of standardization so in totally different level rather than How will you try to do that? Are you trying, I know that you're meeting with lots of world leaders, sure, so you're course, trying to attract investment uh, I uh, previously election? mentioned that we are now working on four different power plant projects. One is uh, dealing with French and uh, okay. Japanese companies. Mm -hmm. The another, one, another two is dealing with Chinese and another one is also uh, all these uh, private companies is coming now okay. and also in hydro uh, energy plant uh, dealing with China also mm -hmm. and that's why uh, the all the, all the new standards and technologies coming into this uh, sector. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hinduja, I know that the Hinduja group is now also focusing more on renewables, I, especially with the solar PV sector, I believe, and you see great potential for growth in India in the sector. Um, as you mentioned before, many, many people without even basic electricity. How do you see this transition to this sort of right, of, right now, more expensive, technologically advanced form of electricity? Will that go smoothly? Well, you see, as I told you that uh, India needs a technology. There's no doubt about it. And in manufacturing, the capacity in India in manufacturing, we need a lot of partnerships, collaborations from different, different parts of the world. And that is why today, General Electric, like GE, you know, mm -hmm. they have had a big uh, base in India now. They are also going in a big way into go in a big plan. I've been talking with Chinese friends of mine, to see how we could bring in partnership, because partnership is the growth in India. <coughs> we, we don't have enough capacity to cope up with the requirement of India right. as for the mm -hmm. energy requirements mm -hmm. that are there. Renewable energy will take a long way to go. Right. To replace coal into renewable energy mm -hmm. is not in one day. Mm -hmm. Rome is not built in a day, you know. It will take years to... 20 years? No, I would say till 2020, you know, it can, 2022, it can go into it. Okay. But there are different, different programs which are going on in different, different states mm -hmm. in India. So there is a huge energy programs, plans are going on. Okay. And with that program, we need, a, the government is, you know, supporting mm -hmm. in a big way. And we are trying to see that how, China can play a very important role mm -hmm. with India okay. because China's financial problems which are everybody is yes. facing, this is the time right. China and India mm -hmm. can work in a close tie. So let me toss it back to Mr. Lin now. Um, solar power generated, expected to generate over 14% of global total electricity by 2040. Of course, China also has big goals for solar energy. What do you see as the challenges because of course not every country enjoys up to 300 days of sunny weather. What are the major challenges facing the solar power industry? Of course the major challenge at this moment is the cost. Cost. It's still more expensive and also that moving forward when the solar power reaches a certain proportion it will be cost on the system. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the, the cost is still the major problem at this moment. Okay. But moving forward when the 
when the solar and wind reach a certain proportion, the major optical will be the energy storage. If we don't have any storage, I don't believe that wind and solar will go too far. Because uh, uh, when we do it certain proportion and beyond, the system cost will be enormous. Mm -hmm. that, that you, you really cannot stand it. So the, the, I would believe in the, energy, in the clean energy development, not only we need to focus on wind and solar, the energy storage will need to be there. It, mm -hmm. I, in my view, it's a, it's a central part of it. Okay. Well, Mr. Kim, you're in the industry, of course, of solar energy. How far are we along in terms of technology storage? Is that really still a big issue? I think, uh, I think we've, seen the, we've seen the issue of storage come up in uh, areas where there's actually a lot of solar saturation. For instance, in Hawaii, I think uh, almost 30% of households have uh, solar panels now. And I think uh, storage has become an issue. But I think uh, at least for the next four or five years, I think most countries will not see that kind of uh, rapid penetra penetration as much mm -hmm. as below, I think anything below 5%, I think the conventional grid can still handle. Mm -hmm. But I think eventually after 2020 and as we get past the double digit mark, I think which we will within uh, 10 years, I think uh, storage will become a big issue. But I think uh, that, Research has been done on that issue, but I think because so far we've been focused on lithium ion batteries, which are more focused for electric cars, but I think grid level storage is a very different, uh, has different demands and different uh, mm -hmm. size and different uh, cycles. So I think once uh, people realize that there's uh, money to be made and mm -hmm. this is an actual need, I think uh, the, the technology will accelerate much faster. But okay. I think in terms of solar energy itself, solar panels itself, I think because of mass adoption in both, mm -hmm. uh, it was led by Europe, but now in China, okay. I think the costs have come down All very right. significantly. Um, I want to switch track now and talk about regional energy infrastructure. Um, one Belt, One Road has been mentioned as well. And even in his opening plenary speech, Premier Lin Li mentioned also um, international manufacturing cooperation. I was wondering how that would apply to the energy sector as well. So if any of you would like to just sort of jump in and with some comments on how you see that, the regional energy. Yes, Prime Minister. Uh, for Mongolia, it's uh, in terms of region, it's very understandable terminology for us because Mongolia is, we need to focus solely on Northeast Asian region, including China, including Japan and Korea. Because Korea and Japan, as you said, uh, they, in terms of natural resources, mm -hmm. uh, of course, there's, uh, they need to address this issue, and Mongolia has the answer. Right. And but they have uh, the financial uh, financial power, and but also technology, technology. and mm -hmm. good mix of this one, providing with um, China, uh, connecting with China. For example, uh, now they're building up uh, new uh, high voltage transmission uh, lines. Mm -hmm. It's DC lines, it's uh, right. Marriott. And uh, this is also one of the key. Mm -hmm. And also with Japanese government, you're also talking about um, also energy sector collaboration right. for a longer period of time, including mm -hmm. not only this cotton calls, but also uh, rare, uh, earth element and mm -hmm. also uranium. Mm -hmm. And this is the certainly areas also we need to do. But it's more difficult for Mongolia because you're also landlocked, aren't you? To get to Korea, to get to Japan, you'll have to, how do you, how do you plan to transfer uh, all that energy? We always thought that is our biggest disadvantage because Mongolia is the second biggest landlocked country in yes. the world. But we surrounded, apparently we acknowledge that, we surrounded by two <laughs> big oceans, uh -huh. two big markets. And that's where all this uh, sea road also going to China going to Japan and Korea as well. Mm -hmm. and that's why it's a good uh, advantage for us. Mm -hmm. And that's why using uh, their market, their capacity, and mm -hmm. approaching them, that's now issue. And again, I agree with the uh, respected uh, experts of this uh, sector is that the cost is the most important thing right now. Mm -hmm. And that's why keeping a uh, proper cost competing uh, you know, on the market value, right. that's the key okay. to job uh, particular region. Mm -hmm. Mr. What do you think about the Prime Minister's comments about how, uh, Mr. Kim first, about how Mongolia can transfer its energy and this regional sort of energy give and take? Um, yes, how so, I mean, I think uh, so we've, we've seen where I think uh, a lot of collaboration opportunities, for instance, where we've, where we've uh, sourced a lot of our materials from uh, China with the supply chain. Okay. And because we have manufacturing not only in China, but also in uh, Malaysia, 
in Southeast Asia, we've been utilizing the relatively lower cost of labor and lower energy prices with uh, technology from Korea as well. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of uh, what, what the Prime Minister said in terms of the, I guess, I think because there's so much land available and because the irrigation is so good, I could see where we could have large, large solar projects in Mongolia and have, as long as we have the infrastructure in place to transport that energy to where energy is more needed mm -hmm. in the coastal regions of China or even to Korea. Did you want to say? Uh, let me talk about in a more general uh, perspective. I think China, China's message is quite clear. We have a large overcapacity at this moment, not just energy, or all, all other sectors. Mm -hmm. And the message here is that, look, uh, we can manage mutually from this overcapacity. In other words, my coal-fired power plant, most effective system there, can generate much cheaper than the new one you're going to build. Of course, the, 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 from any from government perspective, that's, this is quite obvious. However, there's, uh, there's uh, some uh, difficulties, uh, for example, like political mm -hmm. issues. And that. But I would say that moving forward, that uh, the energy company also preparing for that. The, the, the energy company traditionally is quite busy, you know, try to meet the demand. When China doing 100 gigawatt per year, that's larger than, than most of the country, right. overall capacity in the world. So at that time, that we do not have time to focus on efficiency and innovation mm -hmm. and reforms. So I think the Chinese energy company are preparing for the, 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 the try to, if let's say energy, if, we, if energy demand keep a current level, let's say electricity go to 3%. Okay. 20% of the surplus, it takes a long time. Okay. And possibly will many for many neighboring countries. Mm. Well, Mr. Hinduja, um, let's talk about India. Obviously, energy security will also be an issue, energy self-sufficiency. Um, what is your take on how India will play in the regional sort of energy security issue? I didn't get your question. Uh, the question is, with India's own sort of issues, energy issues, how will it sort of integrate with the regional uh, energy infrastructure? How do you foresee that? How, what role will Ener India play? Well, you see, uh, you, you can see about the hydropower, mm -hmm. you know, from Bhutan. You know, we have built uh, hydropower in Bhutan, where the energy is coming in, you know, to India. In a similar manner, now we are planning to see through Nepal. There they have a hydropower capacity also. But um, wasn't, isn't hydropower even more expensive than solar right now? No? Hmm? Hydropower, isn't it even more expensive than solar? No, hydro, no? you see hydropower, mm -hmm. India has the know-how. Oh, okay. And they have built up uh, several projects in India. Okay. So they are trying to bring in the energy through the transmission mm -hmm. from the other part of the world. Now you see today in, uh, in India, there is a huge, China has got a huge manufacturing capacity of uh, solar panels, which they are not able to consume. Now these panels, if they are given to India, this can be a great uh, you know, uh, help for both the economies. Their manufacturing capacity can grow in a big way, mm -hmm. and they can move it into the cost-wise which can be a win-win situation, like the Prime Minister said today, you know, uh, you heard in the speech, right, right. Mr. Lee Instead said, competing. that there can be a win-win situation for the countries if they are able to cooperate with each other. Okay. So this cooperation's mm -hmm. plan of understanding has to be done by the people to sit together and come to a solution. And this can be of a great solution for, also not for India, but for the African countries. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I just want to, um, before, we don't have much time for the audience questions, but before we turn to the audience, very briefly, can I just get each of your views on COP21, how your countries will be responding to that and what your views are? Do we stand a very reasonable chance of the world agreeing to a legally binding agreement to cut carbon emissions, your, your take on COP21 coming at the end of the year in Paris. Very short answer, so we can turn to the audience for questions. Starting with Mr. Lin. I think it's more, uh, it's more promising at this moment, but still difficult. Uh, with uh, China's number at, okay. at this point, uh, I think it's, uh, China has a very good uh, 
chance of uh, trying to convince other people that his target on CO2 emissions will be met. Okay. And if that will help the general agreement, then I think it's a, it's a good. I'm sure China will yeah. play a major role. Right. Mr. Kim? Uh, I'm personally pretty optimistic because I think, uh, <clears throat> I think economics will drive uh, for economics and because I think innovation will continue in the manufacturing sector to drive and to allow that to happen. So I think I'm pretty optimistic that China and others will be able to meet those pretty uh, ambitious numbers. And India? Well, I see that the, uh, the energy uh, control in the world is today by two countries, America and China. If America and China comes to some understanding, mm -hmm. so the problem of the energy is, you know, can be solved. With the African world, which is a big continent, same thing in India in a big way. And this is a time where I mean to say the visit of the president of China, which is going to take place, you know, in Washington, that should be an agenda where they should talk about this energy issue. Okay. Very brief answer. And uh, <coughs> we enacting yeah, yeah. all these uh, laws, policy guidelines, and mm -hmm. moving in the right direction. Okay. Well, we have about 18 minutes left, so I would like to open up the floor now. Please raise your hand and wait for our staff to hand you a mic. I think the first question came from here, right in front of me. Yes? In the front row? Front row? Yes. Look to your right, please, yes, sir. In the region, uh, we have obvious inefficiencies. You said about... Please identify uh, yourself. Uh, my, my name is Zorik. I'm a former Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources from Mongolia. Okay. In the region, we have obvious, uh, very obvious inefficiencies. You said there is an overcapacity, big overcapacity now in China, but at the same time, we have a highest uh, priced market in Japan. We have uh, Northeast Asian region is the large, one of the largest producers of emissions, but at the same time, we have a Gobi Desert which is the second largest in terms of the renewable energy potential after Sahara Desert. Russia and Mongolia could be one of the cheapest producers of energy, hydro as well as coal. But so to address these inefficiencies, we, we require a regional action. And opening and liberalizing the markets, connecting the markets, I think the obvious actions that are required. Do you Jennifer. think, especially the Prime Minister, do you think there is a necessity for a regional forum, especially Northeast Asian regional forum, at the governmental and business level to address this liberalization and connectivity issues at the regional level? Thank you. For exactly for this reason, so we just held a regional meeting in Lombardy in July of this year mm -hmm. and talked exactly about these topics. And again, I really uh, also agree with Mr. Zarek, former uh, minister for this sector and uh, the connectivity is the most important thing right now, networking. But again, to establish this network, to establish this connectivity, the most important factor is that cost. And I agree with uh, Mr. Jin and he's saying, even though China has now our capacity, again, the main player in this situation, in this environment, the cost. If you uh, providing the low-cost energy, I think any government will go after that, and that's the key. Okay, thank you for your question. I know we have one at the back there. Thank you, Kenton from Myanmar. I'd just like to ask a question to Mr. Lim. Since you, China has an overcapacity and the regional country has a huge demand, do you foresee the Silk Road uh, power grid? And what are the challenges to visualize this kind of infrastructure? Thank you. Well, China would really love to do that. But now the question is that or how, why the all other countries would respond to that or not. I really believe that the Premier Lee's idea of sharing the capacity is really good for everyone. And um, interconnection, I mean that you can do really level up the, the, the tariff and also reduce the cost. And even more important, we can absorb higher percentage of the green energy, given the condition that we still don't have storage at this moment. So put everything together, you're right. I think it's quite important. And China is determined to move in that direction, uh, one way or the other. So that now the question is, uh, how are the countries going to respond to China's uh, request and most of China's encouragement? OK. We have on the second row here. 
My name is uh, Kjell Stær from a company Danfoss. Uh, there's one thing I, um, I miss in your presentation, and that is the focus on energy efficiency. Uh, there is an enormous potential with fast feedback, or with fast uh, uh, payback, if we uh, focus on uh, that part of uh, our energy options, or explore that part, and the technology is ready for that. If we take a building we sit in right now, we can have air conditioning units that are uh, cooling uh, the building down with 30% less energy. The technology is ready today, but I think we need legislation to support and trigger that. But the payback time we are talking Sorry, about 20, uh, or we are talking about two, three years, whereas for when we are talking about energy supply, windmills, we are talking about uh, payback times of 20 years. It's much faster. The same goes for surplus energy. Okay. We have been uh, running a project with uh, heat plants in northern China, and uh, the surplus uh, energy is used for district heating. And that is also, here we are also talking about two, three years payback time. Sorry, do you have a question? I is miss the focus on that would when like, we uh, want to like explore to? that. Okay. Don't you see there is a huge potential okay. there? Would anyone like to address the issue of energy efficiency? As he pointed out, we have not addressed that in our discussion. I think that's a very good, uh, very good question. And I also believe that the energy efficiency potential is enormous, particularly in developing countries. As I said, uh, China now is getting ready to address the efficiency issue. Let's go back to my earlier comment. Before we really busy we can meet, try to meet the demand. So busy that efficiency is really not the first priority. But moving forward, efficiency become number one, meeting demand become number two. That's why we have a reforms. The Premier Li Keqiang emphasized many times, next five years, in fact, next six years from now until 20, 2020 will be the reform years for China. Not only for any sector, also for other sectors. And from the company perspective, what are, are they going to go? Because the, it cannot go for quantity anymore. So right now, what they try to figure out is how to manage from macro level reform, try to get efficiency at micro level, and focus on innovation, on the cost cutting, and also efficiency, etc. So I think that from both sides, in the future, China is going to be very, very, very good on, on, on well, this one. What about other countries? Would you like to step in and talk about energy efficiency? Um, no? OK, we'll move on to another question then. Yes. Second row. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm with Tencent Finance News. I'm with Tencent Finance. Uh, my question goes to Mongolian Premier. How do you make sure the Mongolian regime stays stable enough to protect the uh, investors' money within Mongolia? We know that when regime changes, some negotiations and projects were interrupted. Thank you for a good and direct question, and I also want to address this issue as well. And Mongolia is actually a two-party system country, and uh, whoever comes into the power and in terms of uh, foreign investment, in terms of investment policy, in terms of stability, will be there won't be any changes. And I am saying it very, uh, with uh, full, uh, very officially. Uh, I'm trying to explain it. And next year also we're going to have uh, election. Uh, every four years we have elections, but in terms of foreign policy, investment policy, there is no changes. And also we have investment uh, law, and uh, according to this investment law, any investor, no matter who is foreign, who is local, is going to be treated equally as same. And also government, every day's action is trying to reduce these corruption issues, uh, bureaucratic issues, and no matter who is coming and uh, no matter after changing the policies, there is no changes and 
as I previously mentioned, Mr. Zorichtis, previous energy minister is sitting there, and current energy minister, Mr. Zorichtis, is also sitting here. And <coughs> no changes, even in names of ministers, no okay. changes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for your question. I think we have time for one more question. Yes? Uh, hi, Ken Choi from Chosen Daily Newspaper, Korea. Uh, none of you talked about uh, the effect of U.S. shale gas on the energy market. Um, can, you, can somebody just elaborate about how you guys are preparing uh, about the U.S. shale gas? Mm -hmm. So the impact of U.S. shale. Yes, Mr. Uh, so I think there's, a, there's been a lot of uh, perception that renewables will be hurt very badly by uh, the shale gas in the United States. Uh, but I think we could, or we've experienced, in the solar industry, we've experienced very low gas price, historically low gas prices for many, many, uh, for over five, six years in the United States already. And the U.S. is one of the hottest growing markets for solar energy at this time, and I think also for wind as well. So I think shale gas, I think, is a direct threat to uh, coal and other forms of conventional power, but I think in terms of renewables, I think uh, the shale gas impact does not impact uh, renewables as much as it's uh, commonly thought, especially in Asia. Mm -hmm. But I will say natural gas. Sorry? Is natural <coughs> gas, you know the gas in India. Yes. This yes. is going to replace the coal as well ah. in India. <laughs> Well, gas has been touted as sort of like the bridging energy, hasn't it, between oil and renewables right, as well. And, right. and do you all share that view that it will yeah. be the golden age there of gas? There will be We've a great future. There will be a great future for the gas, you know, to replace mm. the coal. Everyone agrees or anyone disagree? Well, a few months ago, we still believe that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> you see? <laughs> okay, well, we have about a um, couple of minutes left, and I want to ask each of our panelists to just briefly mention your biggest takeaway from this session, and maybe that you would like to share with our audience what they should take from this session as well. Just very briefly, each comment from each panelist, okay? Let's begin with Prime Minister Chimet. Oh, you know, the situation in the market is very clear, and tendencies is also very clear. And also the situation with China, situation with Japan, Korea, and it's understandable. And now the main thing is that we need to make more actions. We need to make more investment. We, make to, uh, we need to make uh, more networks. But again, uh, the most important thing, as I previously mentioned, it's cost-oriented uh, activity. And how to reduce it? it? Is it renewable energy or is it uh, coal and coal? Right now, it, I'm sorry, I'm uh, representing government, uh, prime minister. And we all that's understand. why yes. I, maybe I'm talking very, you know, pragmatically. Mm -hmm. But right now, if you're going to offer to any government is that it's much higher cost and it's renewable energy, this is a little cheaper and uh, right. not uh, cheaper and mm -hmm. it's traditional. Mm -hmm. Of course, any government is going to make this kind of decisions. Right. And um, there is uh, no fortune teller mm -hmm. we will be needed. Okay. But again, uh, we're moving in the right direction. Okay. And that's why in step by step, phase by phase, okay. we need to move to this direction. And again, the technology, the yes. improvement, uh, the standardization, okay. And uh, investment, these the issues mm -hmm. is going to address uh, Thank you, this Prime concern. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hinduja. Well, I would uh, re request the energy ministers who are over here, you know, <laughs> both of them as the, uh -huh. the, if they are going to focus to see how, I mean to say, they can able to help the different countries of the world, because now they have got the technology, they have manufacturing capacity, they have all the potentiality and the best of the uh, mind they have co contributed to China okay. in the energy sector. Mm -hmm. This is the opportunity mm -hmm. that they should come out mm -hmm. and come to the world wherever the energy is requirement, like India and, and India and Africa. Okay. And this is the way they could have a win-win mm -hmm. win -win situation, which we are already doing. We are working with having a dialogue with many Chinese companies right. to come to India mm -hmm. and grow in partnerships. So public-private partnership mm -hmm. should be the best solution okay. for the future Thank for you. the energy Thank you. concept. Mr. Kim? Uh, for me, I think the biggest takeaway was, uh, I guess it reinforced my belief that for, re for renewables to be adopted at a mass scale, cost 
is the, absolutely the most important factor. But also that as long as we can meet the cost, I think there is very real demand and there is a huge potential for economic growth just uh, transforming the power system as well. I think that I have uh, described a quite a difficult situation for energy sector in China. But I, like, I would like to make a personal uh, forecast for what moving forward, what's going to happen. I believe that the current low energy demand is really uh, not the usual situation. It's a system that we should respond to the economic structure, economic changes that suddenly that, you know, be, become a different, uh, very different environment. But moving forward, let's say next year, I believe that electricity demand is going to go from this year from 1% to roughly at least 3% next year. And moving forward, possibly to 4% uh, in the 4 to 5% in the following years. So, so I like to, uh, the reason I'm saying that is that keep, keep believing that China moving forward is, a, is a promising. And Premier Lee saying that, and I also from energy sector, I also like to, like to emphasize that this is a temporary situation. Mm -hmm. And also, if you look at the import, I also assume that the international investors, that from import perspective, our import decline is actually only from the coal sector. But natural gas and oil sector, still, uh, the import still increased substantially mm -hmm. in the first six months of this year. Okay, so as we bring this session to a close, I think the common themes that have arisen is that cost is always a matter, especially for emerging and developing economies, but technology is helping to bring the cost down, as is mutual cooperation and regional collaboration between different stages of technology advanced countries, and this is a collaboration that will only grow in the future through regional forms and other uh, strategic partnerships as well. And as Asia is definitely forecast to be the major driver of energy growth in the future, all eyes will be on us to try to reach that growth in a more sustainable and responsible way. And I'd like to thank the panelists for your insights. And I'd like to also thank our audience for taking part in this special discussion on Asia's energy options from Dalian, China. And this is Adian TV, Nassim Yan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.